my pleasure to welcome you uh, at the IISS uh, for our event, Strategic Partners, the Asymmetric Advantage. My name is Bastian Gigerich. I'm the Director for Defense and Military Analysis here at the IISS, and it is a real pleasure and honor to welcome here uh, today uh, Lieutenant General Scott Barrier, the 22nd uh, Director of the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency. Thank you very much for being here with us, General. You will have seen his uh, impressive CV and bio in the invitation, so I don't want to go into too much detail, but just to say that he had a very distinguished uh, a career uh, and has a very distinguished career in uh, military intelligence, uh, served throughout the U.S., in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in South Korea, um, uh, in a number of uh, intelligence uh, uh, roles. Um, uh, he will speak today about a little bit about what the Defense Intelligence Agency does. Uh, we want to talk about strategic competition. We want to talk about the role of partners. But of course, we also want to talk about uh, Russia and Ukraine, uh, about uh, China and Taiwan. And what we want to do is we'll, we'll do this a bit as a, as a conversational uh, uh, event. So, so we will uh, have a bit of a chat here first, and then we will uh, open it up for uh, a Q&A. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing uh, uh, your thoughts here in the audience and your questions. Uh, just to clarify, we are on the record, um, uh, both for the conversation and for the Q&A part. Um, we are recording as well, uh, so that this will get uploaded to the webpage, uh, uh, the ISS webpage after this event. So uh, if you could turn your mobile phones to silent or off, that would be much appreciated. General, um, I think a lot of people have a vague sense of the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency, but very few people actually have an understanding of how you do what you do. So before we go into strategic competition and what it means, can you perhaps start us off with a few thoughts on how you do what you do, what the Defense Intelligence Agency is and how it operates? Certainly, and Bastion, thanks for having me. It's really, it's really good to be here with you, and uh, welcome everybody, thanks for being here. Um, the Defense Intelligence Agency, is one of 18 intelligence agencies in the, in the U.S. system parked under uh, the Department of Defense. Uh, it is a global organization formed in 1960. Uh, we've got about 16,000 uh, employees assigned to DI. About 70% of those are civilian, about 30% uh, are military, and we have a, a global presence. Um, our mission is foundational military intelligence about all militaries uh, in the world. It's our job to know everything there is to know about militaries around the world, how they train, how they're equipped, how they fight, when they would fight, why they would fight, and how they think. Uh, so that really is the, uh, is the DIA mission. Um, on the global footprint, uh, we, we have an interesting connection to our combatant commands and to our partners around the world. Uh, DIA uh, mans all of the intelligence centers in our combatant commands. So think of U.S. Central Command, U.S. European Command, uh, U.S. Strategic Command, all of those combatant command intelligence teams are manned by DIA uh, civilians, DIA officers. And then, and then the other really neat part about the global uh, footprint bastion is our defense attache service. So think of those uh, military diplomats in 140 countries with accreditation into about 180 countries gives us 180 uh, potential partnerships uh, to, to really uh, work with and, and get after the things that concern us most. We are an all-source intelligence uh, and intelligence operations agency. In other words, we conduct uh, all-source analysis, but we also execute uh, intelligence operations under Title 50, which gives us authorities to, to do some things um, uh, globally in support of the Department of Defense and in support of our nation. General, when we talked before, before coming up, uh, we, we talked a little bit about, a little bit about uh, a strategic competition and the importance of that overall context for, for your work right now. Do you have a view of what strategic competition is and how it affects the Defense Intelligence Agency? I, I do have a view of that, uh, and it feels, it feels kind of like back to the future. Now, you and I, Bastion, you and I didn't talk about this, but um, I entered the Army in, in 1984, and that was the, that was the height of the, the Cold War, a bipolar world, and my first assignment was in Alaska, where our mission in that, in that context was to defend the Alaska pipeline, a strategic pipeline and at the time, as a second lieutenant, I didn't think that was a very cool mission. Uh, but if you think about it in the context of today, it was a pretty cool mission. It could be a, a pretty cool mission again. 
But after that army, we were in the army of the in-between between 1990 and, and 2001, and that was the army of getting ready and training. And uh, the army that we trained with and the fight that we trained for didn't come to fruition because 9-11 changed all that. And then the next 15 or 17 years was about terrorism and counterterrorism and rotation after rotation into various theaters. And then around 2017 or 2018, uh, this notion of strategic competition came up. And it sort of feels like back to the future, uh, back to 1984. So when I think about strategic competition these days, I, I think about nation states um, and its rivalry. And in, in, those, in that rivalry, um, one or more nation states does not adhere to the international rules-based system or wants to change the international rules-based system, and one does not. And so I think that's where we find ourselves today. Our national defense strategy lays that out pretty clearly, what our, what our priorities are. It, it names China as the pacing threat or the pacing challenge. Um, and we, we believe Russia could be an existential challenge here. Um, and as we see this play out in Ukraine, we can talk about that later. But then there are threats, regional threats like North Korea, Iran, and then, and then counterterrorism. The, the terrorism fight will continue and continue. Uh, my son is a, is a, is a Navy uh, lieutenant commander, and he'll probably be dealing with, for, dealing with this for, for his career. So that's going to continue. Uh, so for DIA, um, we sort of have to play, uh, we have to have a court sense about all this, right? So we have to focus on what the NDS tells us to focus, but this global footprint that I mentioned allows us to keep an eye on a lot of different things um, at one time so we can give situational awareness and assessments to the Department of Defense about what's happening. And, and in your introduction, you, you mentioned the importance of, of partners and the, the many relationships that the DIA has and, and, and potentially could, could build on or can build on and does build on. Can you expand on that a little bit um, uh, and uh, uh, talk a little bit about how uh, the DIA is working with those partners um, to strengthen the ability to make those assessments, to, to um, uh, uh, provide intelligence. Um, uh, uh, obviously, in the run-up to um, the war that we're currently mm. witnessing, uh, intelligence was used in, yep. in, in a strategic context almost. That, you know, was built in part on, on partnership. Mm -hmm. um, Talk to us a little bit about that. Sure. So in, in our strategy, we have two lines of effort that, four lines of effort, but two that are, are pretty critical in the context of this conversation. One is intelligence advantage. That is to see first, to know first, to be able to provide uh, information to act first. Uh, and the other one is partnerships. Uh, partnerships are key. Our, our national defense strategy says we can't do this alone. And so uh, we need to establish and reaffirm traditional partnerships that we've had. Um, we probably need to develop some new partnerships. And we should be reevaluating partnerships constantly because sometimes the the partnerships that we had in the war on terror aren't necessarily, not necessarily the, the partnerships that we need um, in the strategic competition uh, uh, framework that we're, we're thinking about. So partnerships are really key. It's not just, it's not just uh, partnerships between intelligence organizations and other countries. It's also partnerships with think tanks, uh, academic organizations, uh, business partners. So partnerships can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But in the, in the context of this, you know, we, the United States has a, has a, a Five Eyes partnership. And that is an intelligence alliance, if you will, that's been around for a long time. It's very effective, and, and our partners work very, very closely together with us in Five Eyes. But there are other partners as well. And I think in the, in the context of uh, the buildup to, uh, to Russia and Ukraine, our, our president and our uh, director of national intelligence, uh, Avril Haines, made a very bold decision to use intelligence and diplomacy to illuminate uh, what the Russians were, were thinking and what they were planning. And, and I think it was really, really effective and an, an example of how to a best example of how to uh, going forward in the future. And it was used, it was used with our partners to, uh, to help convince, um, and it was also used to help uh, our partners in Ukraine, and that, that effort is ongoing today. So partnerships are really key. Can I just pursue that for a little bit, a little bit further? Because you know, there is that, there's that partner engagement that you talked about that, that is critical. There's that intelligence sharing uh, uh, element to it, uh, to convince and to, to uh, create unity of purpose and so on. Uh, but there's, of, of course, also that issue of trust that, mm. that is a condition there, uh, almost. And, and uh, uh, if we cast our mind back to you know, January, early February um, this year, um, I would say it's fair to say that not every partner was as convinced as the next. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about those dynamics? Yeah, so I think uh, it, really, it really starts with policy. And it was, it was pretty interesting to me how quickly um, our policies in the United States were modified to be able to do this um, because we don't go into uh, sharing uh, of this kind of intelligence lightly. And so, so there was very, very uh, careful policy deliberations uh, led by our DNI in this case, and, and we came to the conclusions that we needed to share this information to convince people that this was 
this is actually really going to happen. So it starts, it starts with a policy, uh, but then you have to have a mechanism to share that. And whether that's uh, in, in diplomatic channels or intelligence to intelligence channels, also really, really key, but, but also reaching out uh, to partners early and effectively re really makes a difference. And now that we've touched upon uh, the, the elephant in the room, uh, uh, Russia, Ukraine, the war, um, uh, let's talk a little bit about, um, I mean, you will have looked at this obviously day in, day out, I imagine. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what lessons you, you have learned at this point or identified at this point. Obviously, the end is not here yet, sure. but, but I'm sure you've, you've pulled out a few, a few uh, threads already. Um, uh, and, and, and how you then go about um, uh, leveraging those lessons for either the next phase of this conflict or indeed other conflicts. I mean, how, how do you think about that? Right, so I think uh, as, as you know, we take the bigger lessons away from here, and I'll, I'll start macro and then kind of work down to, to micro, I think one thing is organization. You have to have the right organization in place to be able to support partnerships, and for DIA, that was about setting up a special construct with a group of folks that we pulled together very, very early to start working on this and looking at it hard. That organization is still in place today and probably will be for, for some time to come. That organization then reached out to our UCOM J2 partners and, and helped them set their organization. So you have a linkage from DIA headquarters at Bowling Air Force Base to, to UCOM J2, which is spread between Germany and, and here in the, in the UK, and getting, getting that uh, ecosystem of dialogue, discussion, sharing, and then working working that with uh, with our Ukrainian partners. And I won't go into the details of that, but I would say that I would just say that it is it is it is robust and it has been um, effective. And it was it was built you know slowly over time and it's on trust. And I always say when you have a relationship that turns into a partnership or a friendship, that that is what delivers trust. And so I think I think for all of our, our partnerships right now, it starts with building trust and and builds over time to a point where, where we can do this. How happy were you with the DIA's assessment of Russian, of the Russian armed forces, uh, the Russian military, on 23rd of February? Well, I was very, I was very happy with DIA's assessment of, of when it would happen and what their intent was. Uh, I think uh, we, with uh, other partners in the USIC, uh, called that fairly early. Um, I was, uh, I, I thought we could have done better on um, looking at the Russian army as a whole and how effective uh, they, would, they would be. We, we thought they would be more effective. And in, in, in fact, um, I, I was on record saying uh, it, would, it would go pretty badly pretty quickly. Uh, but the Ukrainians turned out to be very, very resilient. Uh, they also had great leadership with uh, President Zelensky and, uh, and they, they turned it around. But if you, if, you think about, if you think about what they planned for, it was really planning for an occupation not necessarily invasion. I think they had some really, really uh, bad assumptions. And it's, it's really hard to understand because uh, Russian military leaders study Clausewitz. Uh, they, they, know, they know how to do this, but they did not do it. And it, and it really puts into question the entire, the entire Russian system um, as I look back on it today. So, so we got part of it right, but we also got uh, part of it wrong. And that really gets into this notion of analyzing will to fight. And so we, we have done some soul searching within the agency uh, to, uh, to come up with a rigorous analytical model to take in all the factors as it relates to studying uh, a given country's will to fight and the capability of their army and whether or not they will or they won't. Coming out of Afghanistan, uh, this, uh, this issue with uh, Russia and Ukraine, I think, I think we, we, uh, we, we've got some work to do there. Yeah, yeah. The uh, qualitative aspects of military capability are very hard to measure, are very hard to assess. Well, and when you, and when you, when, yeah, when you look at the, the Russian army from, from the, the uh, Chechnya, uh, to Georgia, to Crimea 2014, uh, to what they've done uh, in Syria. You know, they built the New Look Army. The New Look Army looked okay. Uh, we did some work on that. Um, and, then, and then when they employed the New Look Army, it, it didn't do as well. Those battalion tactical groups uh, didn't do as well as they probably could have. Uh, the battalion tactical group concept is not a bad concept, uh, but for, for many reasons, from, from planning to execution to training to a lack of a non-commissioned officer corps, uh, they were not able to uh, to achieve their objectives. When you spoke about the the uh, almost preemptive use of, of intelligence in the in the run up uh, uh, to the war and and its very early early phases, um, uh, I imagine uh, there must have been quite a bit of a, a revolution inside the system to allow for the rapid, I guess, declassification mm -hmm. of of certain 
uh, uh, types of intelligence, certain bits of information. Um, have, has that worked itself into a new normal? Is this, is this what we should expect in, in, in the future? I would say no. Um, for, for us within the defense intelligence enterprise, if you've been uh, deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan with our partners, there's always this notion of, of uh, a quick passage of information on force protection related threats and issues. And so for many of us in uniform, it was, it was second nature to be able to do this. But at a national level, I think, I think we have observed what the best practice is, and I think we'll take lessons away from this, but it won't be a cart, a cart blush change to, to uh, the way we, we operate today. But I think, I think we'll, we'll learn lessons from this that'll make it very, very quick next time. And I mean, if I just can, can dwell on this point a little bit longer, because there's, there's an interesting dimension also uh, uh, because the private sector is now um, providing cap capacity and capability that a few years ago uh, would have been the remit of a few nation states. Sure. And, and now it's available uh, for any, anybody with a credit card and, and uh, uh, good or bad. Um, mm -hmm. How does that interact with what you're doing? Well, certainly the, the plethora of open source information that's available out there is, is, um, is, a, is a tool that we have to take advantage of and, and we, we must do that and we have to do it pretty, pretty well. Um, back in about 1977, a former director of DIA, even back then, his, his name was Lieutenant General Sam Wilson, he said, hey, 70% of everything DIA does um, could be found in open source. We'll, we'll cascade that comment to 2023 and, and there's a lot that we do that you could find um, in open source today. So we have an open source intelligence center. Uh, we are the Defense Intel Enterprise Manager for open source across uh, the Department of Defense. So we've got to make sure that our, our training is straight, our tradecraft is straight, that uh, various organizations are not getting ripped off buying data sets. Hard to believe, but it happens. Um, and so we've got to get our act together within the, within the Defense uh, Intelligence Enterprise on open source. But I, I think it's a, a huge opportunity for us to really uh, harness uh, the power of globalization, what's happening um, in, in social media spheres and, and everything else. You mentioned earlier on uh, that obviously from the U.S. point of view, China is the pacing threat. Um, so I want, to, I want to change perspective a little bit and, and talk about uh, China and talk about Taiwan. Um, uh, that must be at the top or near the top of your, of your agenda, um, uh, I imagine. Um, uh, and obviously there's that sense that we're heading, heading towards a, uh, a period that uh, where there might be a change of gears uh, and, and the uh, uh, possibility of conflict is, is now um, judged in actually a, a more of a near-term time frame than, mm. than until, until uh, very recently. So how is that shaping your strategy for your agency and for what you're doing? Future yeah, so, so we, we are in an effort to um, operationalize the intelligence that we produce and provide options uh, to the Department of Defense. In this case, uh, with the pacing threat, we've stood up another regional center within DI, a regional intelligence center called the China Mission Group, uh, CMG. And that is a, a group of analysts, mission managers, uh, operators, and collectors that all focus uh, on that problem set. But if I could just step back for a second and, and uh, just maybe paint a bit of a picture on, on how I think about uh, China. So I, I think about it um, as a cable with, with uh, three strands. And that, that first cable really is uh, Xi's uh, political strategy to secure himself, secure the party, and secure the military. And with a recent party congress, uh, we've seen him do just that with the people that he's put into position. So he's really entrenched himself. Um, the, second, the second strand of that cable is really the, the Belt Road Initiative and the economic strategy that he's, he's developed to, uh, to move into nations, to buy debt, to provide infrastructure, and then also use that for other platforms to do uh, other things. Somewhat stalled by COVID, but still, but still strong and still, still moving along. And then the, the third cable in the strand is his mil military strategy, which is to, uh, to create a world-class military uh, to be on par with uh, the U.S. military by 2049. And, and he said this, and he said it in numer numerous speeches, and he wants to have the capability to uh, take Taiwan by force, if necessary, by, by 2027. Uh, there's a milestone out there about 2035, and I take him, uh, I take him uh, at his word. But if you think of that three-stranded cable, there is a, a sheath that that cable is wrapped in, and that is the, the largest theft of intellectual property in the history of mankind. And if you look at the modernization in his strategy, he is... Uh, China has stolen uh, secrets from, from all of us to be able to, uh, to put that together. And I think that, I think that continues uh, today. And, and so this question about Taiwan, uh, we, we know that, that uh, they would like to compel uh, Taiwan back into the fold uh, under the PRC 
uh, in the party. I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that they will do it by force, but they certainly appear to be building the military capability to do that in big ways, whether it's in space, whether that's in cyber, whether that's their maritime force, their land force, uh, their air forces. We see increased activity around, around the island of Taiwan uh, consistently, and, and so they're, they're uh, doing a lot more military activity there uh, now than they were, say, 10 years ago. Mm. Have, you, have you taken or identified any particular lessons that you think uh, China has learned from uh, Russia's war against Ukraine? Is there anything that you, anything that you would point out as? I, I think that the PLA will, will take a long time to, to study this conflict, uh, to determine what Russia didn't do well and perhaps what they could do uh, better. I also think that Taiwan will take lessons away from this and what they need to do and, and how, how, uh, how well leadership can do uh, when they hang in there and they're, and they're committed. So I, I think both, both uh, parties will study this fight for a long time and come to some conclusions about what they, what they need to do. And I mean, I suppose that also applies to you because the, the, same, the same logic uh, that you mentioned in the context of Russia and Ukraine about partnerships mm -hmm. and the importance of being prepared I assume that must apply in this context as well. You've put a, you've, you've mentioned the timeline that mm -hmm. one might be working towards. Are you, in terms of preparedness, are we, are we at the right pace? Are we at the right point now in, in preparing for this with partnerships, with having the policies ready, having, you know? I think we are. I think, I think uh, we, we have uh, propelled and advanced uh, our, our intelligence partnerships to a great deal. We've, we've advanced uh, our reorganization within DIA uh, to, to do more on, on this front. And, and I, I think um, within the Indo-Pacific region, if you were to look a map, at a map of, of where DIA is, is uh, located, it would, it would reflect the Cold War in Europe. So we have a very, very strong presence here uh, in, in Europe on this, on this side of the globe and not as strong a presence uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And we aim to change that. Uh, by developing greater partnerships, stronger partnerships, and putting more DI presence and collection capability uh, into the Indo-Pacific over the coming years. Excellent, General. Thank you so much. I think it's a, we've we've reached that point where we'll open up uh, uh, for comments and questions um, uh, from the audience. We have a roving microphone that will find you um, if you could indicate that you're seeking the floor. Um, I have Joseph Dempsey over there. Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, Joseph Dempsey, uh, just stepping in my coffee there, sorry, um, from the Institute, uh, work at Bastion on the Defense Military Analysis Program. Um, you mentioned the opportunities from open source, but I think it might also be interesting to hear a few words about the challenges of open source, not just in terms of the volume that your department has to deal with, uh, but also, particularly in the recent Ukraine crisis, um, the wealth of information out there that is often used for disinformation. Uh, whether intentional or otherwise, verifying that information, but also the wealth of analysts out there um, with varying degrees of training and expertise or self-appointed self even, that have the ability to change the narrative, certainly publicly, uh, potentially in the decision makers that you are influencing as well. Thank you. So uh, we could probably have a separate topic on that, on that discussion all night long. I, I think the, the, the first thing that I would say is in, in, within the defense intelligence agency, we've, we've created a separate career field for what we call open source collectors. So focusing their training and tradecraft on, on doing this as smartly and as safely uh, as possible. And then the other thing I would say is we, we have to make sure that we are adhering to our US laws on how we use open source uh, information, collateral telemetry data, bulk data that's being sold by commercial firms. We have to make sure that we're using that in a way uh, that is legal and appropriate and outside of uh, the United States, because there's a wealth of information there that we can take advantage of if we do it if we do it um, well. And then the other piece is, is really putting standards in place for all the military services um, in the Department of Defense uh, for training, tradecraft, and let's let's make sure that all of our open source reports, OSERs or whatever we want to call them, kind of look the same, kind of have the same tradecraft, and make sure that our analysts are doing the right thing as rigorously as they would if they were dealing with classified information. And then the secret sauce, I think is fusing that rich open source with the really rich um, classified sources for a more fulsome, um, uh, fulsome reporting and situational awareness. Thank you very much. Uh, Maya Nowens, who is uh, a China expert here at the Institute. 
Hi, thank you very much, Bastian. Um, I have two questions, if I may, sir. Sure. The first is about that qualitative assessment of um, adversarial militaries. So having said that we might have un overestimated that qualitative assessment on the Russian part, are we now at risk of perhaps underestimating the Chinese military's qualitative capabilities? And the second question is about the publication of timelines. So I don't think China has specifically said a, a firm date for reunification of, by force with Taiwan, 2049 being the ultimate goal, of course. When we talk about risks for forced reunification in the next two years, or 2027, or 2035, do you think talking about these types of timelines does more help than good, uh, more, or, or more, more harm than good? Uh, and what's the utility of that, do you think? Thank you. Well, I think in the, in the context of uh, strategic competition and, and nation-state rivalry, if, if China talks about it, we should probably be talking about it as well. So I, I, don't, think it, I don't think it does harm. Uh, but we, we have to certainly um, understand that, that uh, in, this global, in this global context, nobody wants to see war. And certainly the United States does not advocate for that. And, and I think um, whatever Taiwan's future is, it's, it's really up to, up to Taiwan. Um, going back to your earlier question about, about will to fight and understanding how to, uh, to orchestrate that in terms of timelines and what we've learned from that, I think we, we have to go back um, and really take a close look at our trade craft and we have to understand what's going on in a given country um, economically, socially, politically, what the historical factors are uh, that have led this culture, these people to where, where they are. and then, and then throw those together with, uh, with a little bit of leadership incentive, uh, do they have the leadership will to fight, and then try to do a better job of determining what that's going to look like. Um, certainly we're thinking about that in the context of, of uh, future conflicts all over the, all over the world, and, and as, we, as we try to understand uh, militaries across, across the world, it will be an element uh, that we choose to study uh, about militaries. Sir. Ben Barry, in the first, first row. I'm from the military team in the ISIS as well, and I'm also a Cold War era British Army military intelligence officer. Um, I'd like to commend to the, all the audience the annual published threat assessment by the DNI, which is a very, very useful overview of all the threats across the world. And in it, you lay quite some stress on transnational threats. Uh, and the one that actually uh, concerns me most is climate change. Would you like to say how you see that as a threat? Uh, sure. Uh, let, me, let me give you my personal view. Um, I think it's real. And I think, I think um, we, we collectively, as a, as a world order, uh, need to do everything we can to, uh, to prevent the calamity that's coming in the future from happening. Uh, from a DIA perspective, we don't study the science of climate change, but we study the impact of climate change on militaries around the world. What is it doing uh, to their bases? How is it affecting deployments, operations? Uh, what does it mean for the future? How are, how are resources or lack of resources or uh, the, uh, the competition for resources based on, on climate change changing the face of those militaries? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, while people are, are gathering, I, I, I just want to, uh, there are a few more questions, but I, wanna, I want to, uh, before I lose my, my train of thought, you go back to a, a China-related point uh, triggered by what Maya asked you. You mentioned the uh, China Mission Group. Um, can you talk a little bit more about this? I mean, is this, how, how should we think about this? Is this, is this just a place where, where all the threats come together, or is it a new model of doing it, or what's the, what's the, what's the benefit yeah. uh, that it will generate? No, it's, it's a great question. So, uh, let, me, let me back up a little bit to uh, my entry into DI a couple of years ago. When, when I first got there, um, I asked some questions about how we were postured and how we were organized to deal with what the NDS was asking us to do. And it turned out that we had uh, these, these regional intelligence centers, or what we call integrated intelligence centers, that were aligned to our combatant commands. So we have a, a Europe, Eurasia regional center that's really aligned with, uh, with uh, UCOM. Uh, we had an Asia Pacific regional center which was aligned with, with uh, Indo-PACOM. Uh, the big idea behind those regional centers is they would manage the mission for those, those regions and those, and those uh, areas of interest from cradle to grave, from, hey, what is the collection requirement, what do we know, what do we need to know, and, and kind of take it from there. So as we, as we came in and studied this uh, a couple of years ago, we, we realized that we were not set and postured to really focus on the pacing threat and the existential threat. And so, and so we went, embarked on a reorganization, created a, an entity called the Deputy Director for Global Integration, the DDGI. Uh, for those that have served in militaries before, the DDGI himself is the J3 of DIA. 
We know that J3s have my authority to task uh, and, and grab resources from around the agency to prioritize and focus where we need to focus. And so for the first time ever, we have a sort of a chief operating officer that's doing that uh, on behalf of DIA. And part of that, part of that transition was to create a separate China focus group that would from cradle to grave manage, manage our China mission sets. Um, we've appointed a director and uh, that, that organization has uh, authority from me uh, to really orchestrate uh, collection and other activities to make sure that we know as much as we can know um, about this, this problem uh, going forward in the future. Gentleman here in the second row, and did I see? Yeah, and then. Hello, I'm Rohit Katru. I'm with ITV News. Um, we just got back from her son, um, and saw this sort of wall of euphoria and optimism. We heard uh, Ukrainian officials talking about the war potentially being over in the next five or six months. Um, I wonder, as you did. 11 months ago or so. I wonder if you could share your assessment now of broadly of where you think this war is going, whether there is, whether it is too optimistic to talk about a conclusion coming in the first half of this year. If you can just share your sort of broad thoughts on, on, on where you think the invasion is going in the next sure. 12 months. Sure. Um, so I, I think the Ukrainians have done a magnificent job and when you, when you look at uh, where they were uh, two weeks after that invasion to where they are today, it's been an amazing journey for them, um, in part uh, supported by, by great information sharing, in part supported by a, a, a world order that wants to support uh, Ukraine. We should all be thankful for that, and I think it's, it's something that nobody predicted. Uh, but when I, when I look at the, the current state of play, um, I, w I would sort of uh, refer to it as maybe a winter of woe, right? And so we've got a lot of Ukrainians right now that are suffering uh, because of the attacks that the Russians have conducted on the energy grid, uh, the water resources, and their infrastructure. That's going to take a long time to repair. Meanwhile, we sort of have this, this state of play where we're, we're, we're now kind of going back to sort of a World War I style um, where we've got, we've got lines, and it, and it looks like it, it might, it might um, be static uh, for the next few months. And unless negotiating positions change, um, and I don't, I don't have anything to tell me that that's going to happen anytime soon, I, I think we're, we're stuck in a, in a, in a stalemate here. And uh, the, the future of this conflict, I think, remains to be seen. It would be, it would be premature for me to call that here. That's yeah. probably an unsatisfying uh, yeah. answer to your question, yeah. but it's a, it's a, this, is, this is a conundrum, right? It's a conundrum for, for Ukraine. Thank you. If we can get the microphone just across the aisle to Fenella McGarty. Hi, good evening. Fenella McGarty. I'm the Senior Fellow for Defense Economics at the Institute. Um, I was just wondering if you could share your thoughts on where there is that plethora of perhaps open source intelligence and uh, new private sources of, of that kind of information, how are you dealing with a reduction in transparency from official sources that we're seeing in countries like Russia and China? Um, and also, uh, when you commented on perhaps going beyond government-to-government -government partnerships and looking at industry and think tanks. Can you talk more about the game plan there and how that's starting to shape up already? Sure. Thanks. Um, on, the first, on the first part of your question about, about uh, the transparency piece, so our, our job really is to use um, open source information and sensitive classified, sensitive classified sources to really illuminate. And so where, where, where the DI doesn't go is, is uh, direct messaging. So we, we will not use open source information to get into, into that business. That's the purview of other, other organizations. We, we won't do that. Um, on, the, uh, on the second part of your question, I, th I think uh, where we're going is we have built um, a, a partnership center within uh, this J3 that I talked about. The Deputy Director for Global Integration has a partnership, a partnership team. And so for the first time in, in DI's history, we're putting partnerships into one place. And I, and I need a partnership common operating picture. And that common operating picture will tell me uh, where are our most lucrative partnerships and maybe where there are some not so lucrative partnerships and where I should invest and where I should maybe divest. And so we're working on that right now. And that includes those academic partnerships and uh, partnerships with the defense industrial base. And, and it really comes to our outreach and what it is we want to give partners and what we expect from partners. And so it can't be, it can't be all, all give and, and no take. Um, so we want, we want a partnership that's based on things that we can do for one another, no matter what spectrum you're in, uh, in, in uh, a foreign partner or uh, academic partner or defense industrial based partner. And so we have to make the value proposition uh, worth it as we, as we approach them for areas where we could, could work together on issues. 
That's an interesting uh, question lurking underneath there, which is about resources. Um, for everybody who is, you know, most of us here who are not American, uh, we look at the Defense Intelligence Agency and think, uh, yeah, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, the, the boundless opportunity and resources uh, and, uh, 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 and uh, the reality is probably that you have to make some choices. Yes. Um, and uh, we talked a little bit about, well, the current conflict. We talked a little bit about a possible future conflict with, with China and ta Taiwan. And you already mentioned that, of course, the political guidance in the U.S. is there's a pacing threat there. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you uh, feel uh, needs to come down in order to ramp up uh, uh, elsewhere. I mean, how do you do? You feel the need to balance, or yes, I do feel the need to balance. And even even though we are the DIA, there there are limits to the to the budget. And so we do have to make hard choices. Um, if you recall, uh, President Obama told us to pivot to the Pacific in 2013. Well, in, in 2023, we're actually doing it, um, <laughs> and and that comes at at great cost. Uh, this this is expensive, and so you have to. In a budget that you know is not going to increase exponentially, you have to be able to decide not to do some things. And so that's, that's been a very hard uh, internal conversation uh, inside the defense intelligence enterprise writ large, not just my combat support agency, but, but every combat support agency is dealing with the same sets of issues because we want to, to, to uh, uh, you know, get after this pacing, this pacing challenge that we've talked about. So, so where, do you, where do you take those cuts? Um, do you take them in the open source enterprise? Uh, do you take uh, analytical cuts in other regions? Um, all conversations that happen on a, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis at DIA, and it's a, it's a, it's a constant drumbeat. Um, we have made some, some, some cuts. I, I, I'm not comfortable talking about those cuts here uh, in this venue, but uh, yeah, there's some things that we can't do anymore. Uh, about 10, 12 days ago, uh, the ISS ran the, the Manama Dialogue, a regional security dialogue uh, in, the, in the Kingdom of Bahrain. and, and uh, uh, your, your friend, uh, General Carilla, um, uh, spoke uh, uh, at the dialogue, and he, he talked a lot about um, uh, the use of technology. He spoke about unmanned systems uh, uh, for you know, creating uh, new levels of maritime situational awareness yeah. and so on and so forth. We haven't really talked about technology as such that much. Right. Um, do you want to share sure. a few thoughts on? on sure. I, I talked a little bit about um, what, what it is we are for, and that is foundational yeah. military intelligence. We have, we have an old an old system called the MIDB, the Military Intelligence Integrated Database that's been around forever. And uh, we, we need to uh, update that thing and infuse it with uh, AI ML tools that are out there. And so we're creating a, a tool called MARS. Um, and, and MARS will probably revolutionize the way we, we do all source uh, foundational intelligence. And so, and so the, uh, the infusion of technology into that system will, will take hold probably in a couple of more years. And we'll, we'll transition off MIDB uh, and into MARS. But I think in the, in the broader construct, of uh, Department of Defense and joint warfighting, we have to be able to start with that foundational um, understanding before we can do anything um, in a future warfight. And so um, organizations like the NGA with their MAVEN program, organizations like NRO with, with all of the visualization tools that they have and, and, and feeds of information all combine, um, we think, in one, in one place to be able to do this. And I think, I think the Defense Intelligence Agency can, can lead in this area to try to pull these things together, these disparate tools into a comprehensive uh, situational awareness tool for the Department of Defense. And so as we go forward uh, with our combat support agency partners, that's what we're trying to do. Thank you very much. So looking around the room, whether we have final, yes. Can we get the microphone first? Yes, if we can pass it on. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, Viraj Solanki. I'm a research associate in the South Asia program here at the IISS. You talked of the DIA increasing its presence in the Indo-Pacific region. What steps are the DIA taking to increase its presence in this region, and how can you better leverage a minilateral grouping such as the Quad, along with uh, Japan, Australia, and India, to help increase uh, the DIS presence in this region? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so so we're we're looking for anybody that wants uh, wants to have a, a deeper a deeper partnership. So conversations with our partners in in India, the Philippines, Indonesia, Australia are ongoing uh, right now. We we think that we've got a pretty good footprint um, in the Republic of Korea. We do have a footprint uh, in Japan. We have a footprint in Hawaii. But we need we need more in other places. So those those conversations are ongoing right now, and I'm confident um, in a number of, of of months we'll have some fidelity on where exactly that that footprint will expand. Okay, just triggered by by this, and, and then we've got one more uh, question in the room. But but triggered by this question in the context of strategic competition and how you have earlier uh, spoken about it. Do you? 
in your view, are there other swing states that that you know that one can uh, focus on and and pull uh, to the other side of the ledger when it comes, you know, to to uh, protecting the international order? No, I, listen, listen. I think that's a, that's that's a great question. We have to be strategic about this because there, you know, we have we have partnerships in the Indo-Pacific region, and, and let's let's face it, the, the PRC is a large presence out there. And uh, they're trying to, to balance, and we don't want them to have to make a choice, but we, we want to have a conversation with them, and and so that'll be that'll be ongoing, and uh, we'll be we'll be very deliberate about how we do that. But uh, this is a big this is a big problem, and uh, uh, the PRC has greatly expanded in the Indo-Pacific region. And let's face it, they come with they come with cash, and they come with uh, with projects, and so we've got to be able to counter that. Uh, can we get the microphone here, the second row, please? Yes. Thank you for this conversation. It's great. Sure. Uh, Latika Burke from the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, just on this, do you think that you've left your pivot to the Indo-Pacific too late? Because we've seen what's happened with the Solomons. China has essentially brought up a lot of these states that we're now belatedly trying to go in and, and re-influence and regain back. Um, has the US left it too late? I was surprised to hear you say you're now looking to increase your footprint in the Indo-Pacific. Yeah. I would have thought that should have happened a decade ago. Yeah, it probably should have happened a decade ago, but we were embroiled in a few things in, in the US Central Command region. You know, when, when uh, you know, this, this whole notion about pivoting and when to pivot, I, th I think everybody had the intention of doing it. Uh, but distractions happen, right? And uh, and uh, you know our our operations in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and other places. It, it really, really put a drain on resources across the intelligence enterprise, not just not just DIA. So, you know, I say that somewhat facetiously. Um, we we do have a presence in in, in the Indo-Pacific, and uh, probably five or six years ago, we started to change our focus from uh, counterterrorism to uh, other collection kinds of operations in, in the context of what we're talking about now. So it's it's not like it's just starting now. Uh, actually, the, those collection operations started started years ago, but I think our presence uh, could be improved there. But that's a great question. Thank you. Final offer. Over here, Nick Charles. Uh, thank you, uh, Nick Charles. I'm the senior fellow for Naval Forces and Maritime Security here at the Institute. But um, I just wanted to uh, perhaps bring bring together a couple of threads. We, we've we've we've, to, we've talked. You've discussed the the issues around basically the transformation in the in, in the information space and the extent to which it, you know information is now a front uh, in, in 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 competition um, you, you talked about your, the different approaches technology was mentioned as a, uh, a, a an advantage and a tool to, to get greater understanding um, but it, they, it also creates its own vulnerabilities as well mm -hmm. um, and amongst the many uh, lessons that people are taking out of um, out of uh, what's been uh, going on um, uh, in, in Europe here um, issues around resilience uh, are clearly key do, do, do the changes both in the, the information front and the technology and the sourcing and 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 and, and the the uh, the role of information generally does that mean that you need to take a different approach to resilience as well and and I, I, are you looking at that from your perspective too we, we are looking at our perspective you know if if, um, if you look at di's role in this within the u.s system we we run the the top secret network for the federal government um, we call that we call that uh, JOX, and so we have to make that as hard as it can possibly as, as possibly it can be, um, and we we have to be able to have that uh, a flexibility built into that in case something bad happens. Um, so far, we've been okay, uh, but we're building resilience into it um, all the time. And for all of our partners, we we highly recommend um, anything you can do to harden your own network because they are at risk from multiple actors. Uh, some nation states, some not, uh, getting after your data right now as we as we speak, and so everything you can do to to harden those networks is uh, is is a good thing. But we're certainly looking at that, uh, not only in the context of what we have now, but as we modernize our network, as we modernize our tools, um, how can we cascade those out to the field when we need to, and still protect them uh, from from uh, cyber hackers and everything else that are that are out there. So it's a it's a big problem. General Barrier, thank you so much um, for this for this really important uh, for these really important points you made about how Defense Intelligence Agency works, how it is ad ad adapting and adjusting to to the reality of strategic competition, how you think about it, and how you, of course, uh, uh, interact with partners to to manage that reality and and to provide intelligence uh, for decision makers. We talked a little bit about uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine. Uh, we touched upon. China and, and Taiwan. So thank you very much for engaging with all of these questions. 
Um, uh, so I'd like to invite uh, you all to thank our guests in the, in the appropriate way with a round of applause.